Good morning, church! Merry Christmas. Man, I love Christmas. It is one of my favorite times of the year. You know, sometimes when I look back uh, on my life, I think there's no way I should be where I am today. Like, I should be living in a van down by the river. And some of you that have heard me preach for a while, you probably think, yeah, no, you probably should be living in a van. Um, you know, if you would have told me when I was a senior in high school that I would have been uh, a pastor, I would have laughed at you. And it's nothing short of a miracle that I've been at Milan for all this time, like as long as I have. It's almost a miracle. Like I should have been fired multiple times, uh, especially in that first year. You know, many of you can relate because your life today is totally different than it was two years ago three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And it's been my incredible privilege to watch God work in and through and among us. I've seen a lot of people's lives change over the years. And that's what we're going to see in our text this morning. What we're going to see, let me just cut right to the dominant thought if you lose the internet connection. We're going to see that nothing is impossible with God. Let's continue on in our Christmas story, jumping into Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town in Galilee. Now, the people in Judea disdained the Jews in Galilee and claimed they were not kosher because of their contact with the Gentiles there. They especially despised Nazareth. But God, in his grace, chose a girl from Nazareth in Galilee to be the mother of the promised Messiah. This is the same thing. This is the same angel that went to Zechariah earlier in chapter 1. Gabriel stands in the presence of God, and he is the messenger of God. And he sends this angel to this young girl who's a nobody in the middle of no place to bring This great news. Now, notice the detail in the story. This isn't once upon a time in a land far, far away. Luke got all the details he could find. He was a historian who did some investigative reporting. He puts a time stamp on everything he's able to because he wants to write an orderly account that people can fact check because he knows people are not going to believe this. So he's making it easy for them to follow along. So he gives all these facts that you can verify about his account. Continuing in verse 27. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, women during this time in history were largely marginalized, especially if they were older or, or younger and unmarried. Now, when you picture Mary, what do you picture I mean, usually it's that lady in her 30s, right? Look, women in this culture were engaged after their first menstrual cycle. And they were married six months to a year after that. So Mary at this time, 13, 14, 15 years old, she was a young girl. It's hard to trust a girl that age with a cell phone, let alone trust her with the Son of God. I mean, how many 13-year-old girls do you know that are ready to be mother to the Son of God? See, on the outside, Mary isn't special. Small-town girl, peasant family. And many commentators speculated that she might have been illiterate, illiterate, though I find that very hard to believe in a Jewish culture. Later in Luke's gospel, Mary will compose a poem or a song, and she says this, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been merciful of the humble state of his servant. Look at this. From now on, from now on, many generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Now, at first, it sounds a little conceited. How could she say such a thing about herself? But she's able to write these words because she gave birth to Jesus Christ. It all happened just like the angel said. And 2,000 years later, people all over the world in languages she couldn't begin to comprehend know Mary's name. There are a lot of famous people that you don't know have already forgotten even people related to you just a few generations back. 
but yet there are some names here which almost everyone all over the entire world would recognize. What sets Mary apart is her faith. That she believed and lived as though God was going to do what he said he was going to do. She lived as though God had already fulfilled his promise to her. Hey, look, verse 28, going back then to our story. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. It says she was troubled. Some translations say she was startled. Huh, that's a shock. An angel appears out of nowhere. Now that word wondered, it's, it's, not, it's not really a, a terribly good translation. The Greek word means to, to make an audit. It's an accounting term. It means to be adding things up, to weighing, to pondering. It's, it's a term that means to be intentionally rational. Of course she's troubled. Any normal person would be troubled. She's asking, am I really seeing an angel? Is this an hallucination? What's going on? Have I lost my mind? Verse 30, the angel continues. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Now, last week, we talked about how being old in years and without a child meant you were shamed in society. Similar, similarly, being a young woman and pregnant and not married brought shame on you and your family. The very thing that Gabriel said would make her blessed is something that's going to bring her shame. Now Mary in this instance did nothing wrong, but who's going to believe her? Look, there are things in our lives that we are ashamed of, things we don't like to talk about or tell anyone. You know, you hope nobody asks about your freshman year of college. You know, you change the subject when it comes to your first marriage. You intentionally try to dodge conversations about subjects you are ashamed of. But God can use something that our culture or society or neighbors or friends think is shameful. God can take that shameful thing and use it as a testimony to bring glory to himself. If you surrender to him by faith, he can use that as a testimony for his goodness and his grace. See, Christmas is not about pretending that everything is great, that we don't suffer, that we don't have struggles. Christmas is about acknowledging that sometimes things aren't great, and we do suffer, and we do struggle, even at Christmas. And God knows this, that God hears us, that God has gotten involved we live in a world that has been visited by its maker. God showed up. God didn't send Moses. God came himself. He, he's committed to your good. And when we begin to see God that way, it changes the way we see the world. It changes how we walk through hard times. It changes how we celebrate Christmas. It wasn't good times and potato salad. They were hard times. They were difficult times. In the midst of that darkness, God was working and moving. Now notice this word, highly favored. Gabriel shows up and he gives this great announcement. He says, God has favored you. He's chosen you. He's looked over all the earth and he's favored you, Mary. Do you remember hearing that the virgin will be with child? Mary, that's you. The, the word favor literally means undeserved, the undeserved love. It's, it's the word we use for grace, undeserved favor, undeserved merit. The, the word describes the essence of how we are saved and loved and embraced by God. Mary was saved by grace. She was chosen by God to be a recipient of grace. And the same is true for all who become followers of Jesus. We are recipients of grace. God's favor is upon us. So for me, as a Jesus follower, I've received God's grace. He's favored me. If you're a Christian, he's giving you grace. He's favored you, even though we don't deserve it. Remember, she's a small-town girl in the armpit of the Roman Empire. Nazareth is the Matherville of Galilee. And out of everyone he could have chosen, all the people in the world that would be suited to bring the Son of God into the world, he chose someone no one would expect. Because he's trying to make a point. Nothing is impossible 
was God. You know, my, my first question is why her? Right? He could have picked a, a wealthy young woman, an affluent young woman, a beautiful young woman. Instead, he chose Mary. See, this is why I hate religion. Religion is all about what you do to earn God's favor. And following Jesus is all about God favoring you by grace. Taking nobody from nowhere and giving them love. That's what he does. That's why we can't stop singing about how wonderful he is. And he tells her, you're going to give birth to a son and you need to name him Jesus, which means God saves because her son will be her savior. Take a look at verse 32. He will be great and, we be, and will be called son of the most high. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. This child is going to be a king in the line of David. He's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. His kingdom is not of this world. This isn't an ordinary child. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I mean, it's remarkable that those four titles are applied to this child when they belong to God alone. He's Mighty God. He's Everlasting Father, which means he is creator and yet he is born. There's nothing like this claim in any other major religions. He is a human being. However, he's not just some kind of avatar of the divine. He is God. Mary, your child is going to be God. The incarnate, concarnate, which means to take on flesh. That, that God is going to take on flesh. And you are going to birth him into the world. I love verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? <laughs> She's still stuck on the pregnant part, right? Um, I don't know if you know this, Gabriel, since you're an angel and all, but as virgins tend not to have babies. Now, her response is important because remember last week, Zachariah, Zachariah the priest's response? His was not wonderful. How can this be? I'm old. My wife is old. I don't know how this works. I don't know. I, I don't know if you know this. Old people can't have babies. Zachariah's question is, how can this happen? And I want you to look at Mary's question if you're following along in your Bibles. Mary wanted to know not how can. She wanted to know how will. She doesn't argue with God. She doesn't disagree with God. Here's her question. I believe this can happen. How's this going to work? It's a fair question. You know, the Bible can stand up to questions in critical examination. I encourage people to question the Bible, to study the Bible. Ask hard questions. Do research. Dig deep. You will get answered. The Bible can stand up to questions. So the angel answers her in verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One being born will be called the Son of God. Now at this time, the Romans rejected the idea of God having mortal sons. And the Jews certainly would reject this kind of scenario. Why would you include this? Why, why would Luke include this in his gospel? Look, Luke put this in there. Because this is how it happened. People think this is a fairy tale because of stuff like because stuff like this doesn't happen in real life. They're, they're half right. It doesn't happen. So if it did happen, it would be a miracle. We'd want to write it down. Scholars think that the Gospel of Luke was written five, ten years after the resurrection. And at that time, the Gospel had spread throughout the Roman world. The church was off to a great start, and tens of thousands of people put their faith in Jesus, not because of the virgin birth, but because of the resurrection. Mark and John didn't even include this. They didn't even mention this. So why does Luke include this? And Luke would say, because I talked to Mary. I talked to the eyewitnesses. I included it because this is what happened. Now, I have to remind you, because of some of the cults out there uh, that surround Christmas within, uh, how to say that, this is not a physical connection that God, 
This is not a physical connection that God is going to have with Mary. It's a spiritual one. She is a virgin who is going to give birth to Jesus. She's still a virgin when she's giving birth. Jesus is simply the Holy Spirit in a body. Continuing on verse 36. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Do you believe that last line? Do you believe that? That no word from God will ever fail? That God can create everything out of nothing? That God can take an elderly woman like Elizabeth and open her womb? That God can take a virgin like Mary and give her a son? God can take on human flesh and enter into human history as the man Jesus Christ? God can rise from the dead? That God can raise you from the dead? That God can forgive your sins? Through the cross of Jesus Christ, that God hears and answers your prayers, that God can take enemies and make them friends, that God can take two people who are hate each other and they can be reconciled. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that? See, this is why we're happy and hopeful. This is why we sing and pray, because our God is a God of the impossible. God can take nobodies from nowhere and raise up churches. That's what he does. Nothing is impossible with our God. You know, I've talked to men and women who believe that there's no hope for their marriage, no hope for their children. Aren't you telling me that you believe that God can raise a man from the dead, but he can't turn around your marriage? Listen to me. You believe that Jesus died on the cross and that God rose him to life, but you don't think he can turn around your life. You don't think he can give you a second chance, another chance, a fresh beginning. You don't think you can change what you believe. He raised Jesus from the dead. Listen, nothing is impossible with God. No matter who you are or what you've done, nothing is impossible with God. Here's her response to what the angel says. I wonder what yours would be. Here's her response. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Her response is not based on her ability to understand it all, but on the confidence she has in the source of this information. Mary's response is to surrender herself to the will of God. She's experienced the grace of God, and she believes the word of God, and she, and, and she believed that the Spirit of God was going to use her to bring about his Son into the world, the Messiah. Verse 39, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now, she's going to Elizabeth's home, which was about 100 miles on foot from where she was. Teenage girl traveling on her own, 100 miles on foot. Here is my guilty pastoral question. What sacrifices are you making to be in community. I'm going to leave it at that. Maybe a better question is what excuses are you making not to be in community? What excuses are you making not to give, not to serve, not to help? Mary Finds out she's pregnant, young teenage girl. She walks 100 miles to be with her cousin, who the angel told her about. What sacrifices are you willing to make to be in community, to be involved in the lives of a people where God is moving and working? Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Leaping was an expression of joy, right? Joy is a major theme in this chunk of, of Scripture. 
Verse 42, In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Notice it says, among women, not above women. Mary was a sinner, saved by grace, just like us. What makes her special or blessed is that she was the one chosen by God, by grace, to bring about the Messiah into the world, to birth Jesus Christ. And, and that is what makes her blessed above, among women. It's all about Jesus. She's not the Savior. She's not the Messiah. She's a footnote in the story of Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 43. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. There it is. If you continue reading the left of this chapter, that word joy is just going to pop out over and over and over and over again. Because God is doing something great. And the last verse we're going to look at today. Verse 45. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. Why is she blessed? Was it because she was special? Was it because she was holy? Was it because she was better than other women? No. It's because she believed that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. It is her faith that made her blessed. It's the same thing with Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Look, nothing is impossible with God. I want you to know God's making that same promise to you. If you will put your faith and your trust in him, then you can be counted among the righteous. Not because what it, what have you done, but in spite of it. That if you'll believe him, that if you'll lean into him, that if you'll surrender your life to him, you will be blessed by him. Because nothing, nothing is impossible with God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. God, and I thank you for the mag majesty of your word. Lord, it seems like such a humble thing in humble circumstances. You brought your son into the world, not to lord over us, but to die for us. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, in a moment, we're going to take communion. We take communion every week to remember Jesus Christ, his blood that was shed and his body that was broken. So we never forget the price that was paid for us to have a relationship with a living God. We're going to put a couple minutes on the clock, give you a chance to, to pray, give you a chance to prepare communion. When the time's up, I'll pray and we're all going to take communion together.
Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the new life we have in him. And I thank you for that promise. Lord, that we would believe you. That we'd put our trust and hope in you. You'd wash us clean of our sins. That you would free us from the tyranny of sin. And help us to live a life of obedience and following Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, we've only got one sermon left before Christmas. This is the announcement. And next week we are going to look at the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. Hey, do you remember we are having one Christmas Eve service uh, um, December 24th at 530 if you want to join us here for that. And um, until uh, next time, uh, I love you. And I pray for many of you by name. And I hope you are having a Merry Christmas.